but so it's it's it, it, it sounds cool that way, I guess. Okay, I'll let them take it away. Hey everybody, uh, let's get things kicked off here. So thank you, Asan, for that introduction. Uh, and thank you again to Gardner for the support. Uh, as he said, we're Brody and Rafay, and we'll be your MCs for the day today. Uh, so just to get things going right away, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Fidias Diamandis, who is a neuropathologist at the University Health Network and a scientist at the Princess Margaret Cancer Center in Toronto. His research focuses on using chemical biology, deep learning and mass spec based proteomics to solve phenotypic heterogeneity in different brain and glioblastoma niches. He's an associate professor at the University of Toronto in the departments of laboratory medicine and pathobiology. He completed the combined MD PhD program at the University of Toronto and then pursued postgraduate training in neuropathology. So please welcome online Dr. Diamandis for his talk on AI in neuropathology. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, thanks for the invite and the opportunity to, to share some of our work. Um, I can't seem to share the screen. Okay, it may, it may work now. Okay. Okay. So, can every can everyone see my screen? Can you guys see the screen from uh, over there? Okay, perfect. Um, okay, so why don't I begin? So um, yeah, thanks for that introduction. I'm, I'm gonna be talking about artificial intelligence and pathology, but with a focus on uh, implementation strategies. Um, yeah, so I don't have any financial disclosures, but um, I will be encouraging you to participate in some of our initiatives. So um, the, the two ones that I'm gonna be focusing on today are uh, Faro and Codito, and they're both, um, they're both uh, uh, functional, um, uh, products online right now um, that uh, um, are crowdsourcing um, uh, initiatives. So uh, they, they benefit from uh, um, broad uh, participation. So just a little bit about me and why I'm interested in implementation. So when I started my, um, my clinical practice in 2016, this was really the height of uh, the um, deep learning um, movement. Um, and so the, you know, the talk around Toronto with Jeffrey Hinton was that, you know, there probably won't be a need for diagnostic specialties, um, you know, five years from now, given just how powerful this technology was. So, you know, I did what any normal person would do uh, when there's an area of hype around, you, you know, your profession. I just started writing about it, uh, you know, trying to, trying to write some commentaries about how I understood the technology fitting into our discipline just to kind of document, uh, you know, the, the hostile takeover. Um, and, you know, this was an interesting time because it, it, if you talked about AI, you, you pretty much um, uh, got funded. AI meant uh, automatic investment at, at that period in time. So even though I had no intention of um, doing research in this field, we, 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 got, we got funding and we opened an AI lab and, 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 tried, and tried to participate in, in generating some of the solutions um that could be used to automate uh, aspects of pathology and we had a very short-term view you know uh, as i said the 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 understanding was in it, within five years or or, or 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 sooner our field would be completely automated and be and be, be running by uh, by robots so we didn't really have a long-term research strategy so we kind of ran out of ideas in the last couple of years um and so um Given that implementation didn't happen, we've largely been focused on contributing to that uh, kind of next step of translating a lot of the amazing work that has been done in this field and try to make it accessible uh, in a way that could be implemented um, uh, quicker. And the, the idea is not for uh, computers to start making uh, diagnoses, but at least 
for the clinicians to be comfortable with the technology so uh, it, it could happen in a kind of more efficient manner. So um, I'm going to be talking about uh, just some basics, uh, deep learning and pathology, some of the work we've done, and then really come up with some of the uh, implement implementation challenges that I've seen over the last uh, a few years being in this field. The two that I want to talk about uh, particularly is incompatibilities between the technology and uh, the consumer, which is pathologists in this case, uh, and, and the kind of uphill battle of uh, um, trying to integrate computer science into, into medicine, uh, a field that's largely been uh, driven by um, biology in the, in the last uh, two decades. And then, and then the other solution I want to talk about is this idea of partial solutions where you know, individual uh, um, uh, uh, breakthroughs um, usually, um, you know, don't 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 actually solve the uh, the, the real world life problem. Uh, and then uh, these these edge effects or these edge edge cases, as as people call them, really um, uh, limit the application of of these discoveries in real world practice. And the solutions I'm going to pitch to you, mine. Of course, uh, there are many others, but uh, hopefully uh, we can engage you uh, to participate. So. Um, you know, I'm interested in the brain. I'm interested in diagnosing uh, neurological diseases, and there's a spectrum of different ways you can do that. It's not just pathology. In the emergency setting, when someone has a seizure and comes to the hospital, you know, things like imaging or even a bedside, uh, uh, you know, physical exam can pick up um, stigmata of brain tumors like neurofibromas that could kind of alert you to what exactly is going on. Imaging, of course, uh, radiology is... Um, kind of these tests that we can perform uh, in an emergency um, center uh, setting. Uh, so I call these point of care uh, tests. And usually these point of care tests have this um, uh, pattern recognition aspect to them where uh, the doctors are, 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 are tasked to recognize certain patterns and make um, uh, important diagnoses. And then on the other extreme, of course, we have uh, sequencing, whole genome sequencing, molecular profiling. These are much more quantitative techniques, uh, you know, that you can um, assign a specific diagnosis to a specific mutation. But unfortunately, they, they come at a higher cost and, and, and their turnaround time is, is usually not acceptable uh, for the acute care setting. And, and the wonderful thing about pathology, for those of you considering a specialty, is that it lies somewhere in the middle where you can get um, very specific diagnoses in a very reasonable time frame that uh, you know is, is conducive to um, you know actionability. So uh, I, I think pathology has uh, remained the backbone of, of modern medicine because of this um, nice balance between uh, cost, time, uh, turnaround time, and ability to to make uh, very specific diagnoses. So let's look at the workflow so we understand where uh, AI could be. Um, um, uh, leverage. So the first step is we look at these uh, H&E stained tissues. These are basically uh, tissue sections uh, recovered from patient surgeries. We stain them with this pink and purple dye, and then using the architecture of the cells, we're able to um, uh, predict what disease that person has um, uh, to some a fairly uh, good degree. We usually incorporate some biomarkers after. These are usually in, uh, immunohistochemical stains. Again, turnaround time, one to two days. Uh, provide uh, very specific um, readouts about what, what 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 this person may have. We write a report, we integrate that information together, and then of course there's more advanced tests that we may do that re may, may require a few extra weeks to to read out. But at least the report provides um, uh, a good starting point for the clinicians to begin treatment plans. So excellent turnaround time, low tissue requirements, very cost effective, but you know one of the downsides to this uh, pathology workflow is that for the last few, I guess, century, um, there's many manual steps, and, and of course, it's very qualitative and operate, operator dependent. So, you know, th this uh, hopefully is not um, um, new uh, to many of you in this kind of uh, educated audience, but there's there's been an explosion of of convolutional neural networks and deep learning innovations the last decade, and the idea was that. If what we do as clinicians uh, is, is using our eyes, um, uh, so as we see here, uh, light goes in, it bounces off our patients, and we interpret um, what we see uh, by the activation of our kind of neural networks in the back of our brain and come up with a kind of observation. Why can't we just uh, re uh, replace some of these uh, tasks by having computers or these neural networks that, you know, nicely um, recapitulate these uh, uh, visual systems? 
um, and, and integrate those into our um, uh, diagnostic workup. And this is fairly easy in pathology because we have tons of images. So we can take archives of, of large amounts of slides from previous patients. Uh, we can use the reports uh, as our kind of labels. And then by, by throwing these images into a neural network, uh, the neural network will try to associate specific patterns of these digital slides with a specific diagnosis, specific tumor uh, mutations, and other kind of uh, relevant um, uh, clinical um, outcomes and then uh, try to learn what patterns would uh, um, accurately predict those uh, labels. And once you train them, then we can apply them to, uh, to new cases and have these tools to help in our uh, quest to uh, provide uh, patients with uh, accurate diagnoses. And this works extremely well. So this is one of the first experiments we've done, and I haven't changed the slide because I haven't needed to. The, it's like the, the, the ability of these tools to uh, analyze tissue is just incredible. So I'll show you some, some results here. These slides are over you know, a gigabyte uh, in, in digital information. And within a few minutes, uh, we can get these very quantitative and um, kind of topographic readouts of where exactly different tissue elements reside on a slide. Um, and you know, usually we would do this kind of, we would estimate how much necrosis and how much tumor is on a specific slide, but now we have a way to document exactly um, where things are and, 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 and how much of each types of tissue there is. Not only can we, not only can we um, um, locate the lesion, but we can try to quantify it or, 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 or subclassify it into actionable diagnoses. So this is a pie chart of the kind of main tumor types that one would encounter in the general population. So we set out to see, can we get AI to recognize these four main common, common tumor types? Um, peripheral nerve sheath tumors, meningiomas, uh, dural-based tumors, met metastatic tumors to the brain, and, and primary glial tumors. Um, so that's the majority of what I see in a kind of adult uh, hospital care setting. And this is a confusion matrix that shows um, the kind of predicted and true labels. Um, and you can see that, you know, this, this simple classifier that we were able to develop, you know, in just a few weeks, uh, is, is able to effectively uh, differentiate these kind of common tumor types um, in a fairly reasonable real world setting. Now, this is, this is a, a great paper. Um, if, you're in the, if you're in the field, you probably know about it. It's one of our favorite papers that we like to read over and over again because it, just, it was just so well executed. Um, and, and this group really was interested in, in, in using neural networks to uh, differentiate different types of lung cancer. So these are just uh, performance ROC curves that just show that they're able to effectively uh, diagnose uh, squamous and adenocarcinoma, which have uh, significant uh, treatment uh, implications. But not only that, they were able to actually predict mutations, um, so DNA level mutations, just by looking at uh, images on an H and E stain. So, you know, as a pathologist, this is somewhat magical to me that you can predict um, a DNA sequence just by looking at um, patterns of cells under under a microscope. So these are the types of innovations that you read and you say, okay, I need to, I need to start looking for another job. This is, this is, a, this is, this is a transformational for my field. Um, and they did everything right. They, 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 they made a generalizable system and they made it available on GitHub um, so anyone can use. But um, again, what, what was troubling is that you, 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 you know, you, this was in 2018 and I guess I'm old enough now to see that after five years of, uh, of these amazing discoveries, we still don't really have um, any uh, tests that we, at least at, at my hospital, we use routinely to make these diagnoses. Um, and that's not a, a critique for these papers. It's just, you know, this is the state um, of, of the field at this time. So I thought I'd do something interesting. I said, okay, maybe this is not a long, maybe five years is not a very long time. Maybe, maybe that's just very, very um, ambitious of me to expect that innovation would get transformed into clinical practice uh, you know, within five or six years um, or so. So let's see. So let's see, let's see our experiences um, in pathology. How long does an innovation really take to be incorporated into patient practice? So here's another, again, molecular uh, technology where they found these IDH mutations in gliomas. Uh, and these patients tend to live longer in 2009. And, we, um, and within a few years, uh, we were already using them routinely on all our glioma patients. And in 2016, you know, our holy Bible of uh, classification of, of, of brain tumors 
actually incorporated IDH as um, uh, um, the, uh, mutations that are enough to make specific diagnoses. So, um, and we were using these even before this update came along. So within five or six years, I think that is an, a reasonable amount of time to expect something truly innovative to be incorporated into uh, clinical practice. Okay, well, let's look at art artificial intelligence. Maybe there's something wrong with artificial intelligence that takes time. And so, you know, we've all seen ChatGTP, and I think we're all impressed what it can do. But to me, the most impressive thing is within five days, uh, a million users, uh, it, it, it brought a million users um, uh, to this platform. Within two months, it brought 100 million users. So, you know, AI is a, is a really scalable technology. And if... Um, you know, the, 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 you know, the, something has to be um, um, incompatible for such an important AI discovery not to reach clinical practice, given, uh, you know, given these examples. So, um, so I thought about it a bit and I said, okay, well, what, what, what could be the barrier to, um, uh, to this? And I, and I really think it's um, um, the way that we report uh, medical discoveries in biology is, is, is very different than um, than what AI I think is meant to do. AI is a kind of engineering solution that I see, not a knowledge generating um, uh, kind of technology, at least in, in in automation of pathology. And so, when we write a medical paper and make it available to the medical community uh, as a GitHub repository, that's not that useful for uh, clinicians that may not know how to use GitHub or not, may not have sophisticated hardware to run these algorithms. And I thought, well, maybe we should take a page out of you know these AI, um, these AI breakthroughs that that, that have um, kind of become ingrained in our society so quickly, and maybe the the, the real thing that we need is um, platforms that allow clinicians to at least experiment with these tools uh, in, in a relatively short time period, so we can uh, understand where they where they add value in, in, in the clinical setting, and really that's the the first um, uh, tool that we've developed. Um, probably last summer, it's called Codito. You can access this today, uh, codito.co. And really what this is meant to be, it's, it's supposed to be like a marketplace for AI tools. So you can upload an AI, an AI algorithm that you've developed. And um, the idea is to make it super simple for basic people that may not have the right um, hardware or software expertise to upload their, their data, have it analyzed by your AI algorithm and, 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 and then download that data uh, directly onto their computer, um, the same way you would view a video on, on YouTube, right? So um, uh, uh, please check this out. Um, please, uh, if you have an algorithm that you're interested, please uh, feel free to contribute it. it it's, it's, it's completely agnostic to specialty. So even if you're not in pathology, but you think it's something useful that people would use, um, we, we, want, we want this to be a, a kind of a, a marketplace for sharing AI tools. Okay, so, you know, there was another problem, and let me explain to you the problem. So, you know, in conjunction, we were saying, okay, well, maybe the problem of why AI is not being incorporated is that there's all these other steps. There's immunostains that need to be that need to be interpreted, and there's this report that needs to be written. So, even if you perfect step one, maybe that's not enough of a value proposition to get clinicians to be using this in a day-to-day -day basis. So, we said, why don't we just automate the whole process and see if that works? So step two is these kind of quantification of these uh, immunohistochemical biomarkers. And we use this technology called mask RCNN, which is very similar to conventional neural networks, but can now count objects like these cells. And we found that the, you know, we could do this uh, quite, um, quite well. So this is a Pearson correlation, just showing uh, a very high reliability between the AI generated scores and what a, a pathologist would estimate if we showed them the same images. And in fact, um, the AI seemed to be a kind of a happy median. So the, the kind of uh, agreement scores was higher between AI and any individual pathologist than individual pathologists between themselves. Um, and so we thought this was, was great. Um, but then the problem, the next problem was, well, um, to do this properly, we need to be able to align where the tumor is on the slide with where exactly we're going to count these positive and negative cells. And you can see here, these slides, although they're from the same patient and section, uh, they've been mounted 180 degrees in reverse. And this happens very routinely in pathology. And, 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 and we try to visually align it as this um, uh, pathologist is doing right here. So we can 
cross-reference the, the positive areas with where we see the tumor areas on the h &E stain. So um, the solution for this was the same uh, technology that we used to create uh, panoramic photos with the cameras. So uh, scale invariant feature transform allows us to take these uh, images, align them properly so they match, and then we're able to um, um, uh, score immunohistochemical values just where the tumor is. And by doing this, we can now generate those uh, reports that pathologists take time uh, uh, typing out, uh, provide a lot of detail, a lot of high content uh, uh, metrics uh, that could potentially save their time. And we thought that this was gonna be a home run. Here's another report. With a click of a button, you get a very detailed, uh, you know, clinical-like report uh, that kind of details exactly what the computer did, allows you to quickly scan it and make sure that it, it, it's, it, it's doing its job properly and hopefully would save people time. So I showed one of my colleagues and I said, what do you think? And he said, Phidias, this is great, right? This is going, um, I'd love to use it, but can I make one small tweak to your, you know, the algorithm? And, you know, this, the, this is something that took many years to do. So you, you can imagine this was very frustrating. So, you know, we sat back and said, you know, how big of a problem is this? Is this the, you know, uh, and, and I call this the partial solution problems. We solved the solution that maybe was uh, good enough for a very focused research problem. Maybe it's good enough for me, but a particular pathologist with, you know, a different type of clinical practice or, or um, you know, the working style, that, that particular model may not be suitable for their needs. So each, each neural network, um, at least from the papers that I've seen, tries to answer a very focused problem. And every specialty has many hundreds of focused problems that are, you know, with each pathologist having their own idiosyncrasies. And then there's multiple specialties. So really to really execute this, if we wanted to make a tool that uh, thousands of pathologists would use, would really require us to basically write an encyclopedia of neural networks that can be used on a case-by-case -case basis. And this is something, of course, that um, would be impossible for, 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 um, for our lab to do. So we, th we thought long and hard, and we said, well, what about crowdsourcing uh, you know, computational pathology? Wikipedia, uh, you know, that's what Wikipedia did. They, they transform um, uh, encyclopedias by, by letting the general public contribute whatever page the, the general public thought was important. So we tried to develop a similar model with one of our other initiatives called uh, Faro. And basically what this allows people to do is clinicians can upload their digital images that they're interested in, in studying. Faro will um, produce some um, pattern inferences that are you know, uh, histology driven. And then it'll present those kind of uh, inferences to a pathologist to kind of uh, either accept or revise based on their specific um, expertise and interpretations. And through this iterative process, um, anyone can train a, a neural network to um, uh, carry out a specific task in pathology that meets their specific needs. And by community sharing, we could scale um, algorithm development uh, through this process. So this seems to work quite well. So this is an ovarian cancer classifier. So I'm a neuropathologist. So everything we've done has been in neuropathology. But this, uh, this colleague of ours, uh, Dr. Al-Haswani in Saudi Arabia, without having any AI expertise, without having any uh, proper uh, tools um, uh, in her home and in her office, was able to um, revise our report and make it specific for ovarian cancer uh, tissue classification. She told one of her colleagues across this hall, and he was able to also make one for colorectal cancer, again, with no real um, AI expertise, just benefiting from their histological expertise and this kind of automated platform that we've developed. And really that's the um, goal of Faro is to uh, be that crowdsourcing tool that once um, that individual pathologists can generate their own classifiers, make them available, and hopefully by that we will be able to kind of populate these thousands of algorithms that the field, uh, you know, likely needs for this to, to work really well. And, you know, this, of course, can also be done for immunohistochemical stains as well. So, um, you know, these are the tools there, uh, you know, um, the, the decision about which one is right for you is, is, is fairly straightforward in my mind. If you're a coder, if you generate your own algorithms and just want to reach more users, please consider uploading them to Codito. It's free for everyone. 
um, and you get uh, nice analytics and, and people can rate your algorithm. So there's some positive feedback um, uh, if, if that's useful to you. And then if you're a pathologist or a histologist and um, are interested in developing a kind of custom classifier for your own needs and to also share it with the public, uh, please feel free to check out Feral. So I'll stop there. I want to thank the um, the uh, Codito team, the Faro team um, uh, that, that kind of uh, drove a lot of these kind of um, uh, solutions that uh, we think are important, uh, our funders, and of course, everyone else in, in our group. Hello? Testing. Testing. <laughs> so many mic so problems. Many okay, I'll stay over here. Uh, thank you very much for the talk, Dr. Diamandis. We're now going to have uh, a quick. Oh, are we okay? Anyways, we're going to have a question period. Uh, so if anyone has any questions, that mic's going to be on. You can, uh, yeah, you're welcome to jump up. Hello. Yes, I think it's working. Uh, great talk. Uh, great. I don't know if you can hear me. I hope you can. Uh, yes, I can hear you. Okay, great. Um, great conversation. Uh, great talk as well. I really like the aspect of you trying to open sources and crowdfund this to get like more diverse data sets. M my question is with these kind of algorithms, because you show the ROC curves in the papers and they show really nice results, really nice high sensitivity, high specificity. But my interest often goes out then to the the percentage of people that does not fit that specific problem. For example, the 3% that does not get the correct diagnosis, the 4% the that does not get the correct diagnosis. And my question is like, with the, like a little bit the aspect of accountability for like the pathologist and for like the correctness of the data, um, with that percentage that does not have the correct diagnosis, how much of that is maybe due to these kind of data sets being maybe more prone to specific kind of groups of people like because I know that most of the data sets that we have they currently consist out of white male individuals I don't know how that is specifically for pathology if that has any kind of implications but my question is like with these kind of data sets being so specifically for a specific group of people how can we not ensure that these algorithms are not biased themselves yeah, I mean, you know, I think there, there, there there's two aspects to this. Um, uh, first is, you know, not, you know, medicine is not an exact science. And there's, as you said, there's a lot of cultural, there's a lot of uh, genetic, there's a lot of um, surgeon dependent um, variation in, in, in the types of tissue that we see. Um, and, you know, the question becomes is, you know, humans do make mistakes. Um, and the question, I think one of the questions to consider is, are you comfortable with an AI system that makes, um, let's say fewer mistakes than, than, a, than, a, than a human does? So I think that's one way to look at it. Um, you know, on the flip side, a lot of these uh, early, you know, pathology AI um, uh, solutions, you know, they're, 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 they're primitive. We, you know, we would never sign out cases uh, without doing molecular studies. So hopefully the molecular studies are able to capture those three or 4% uh, misclassification. So I always order immunostains, even on the, the most simple cases, because you're right, you know, there, there, there is some variation that could occur by, you know, specific genetic backgrounds that were not inc included in the original, you know, um, you know, demarcation of these diseases. So these extra studies that you know, haven't been yet incorporated into the, you know, these high profile papers will we'll, we'll probably only make things better. Where I think the crowdsourcing is really powerful is that 
you know, we have some colleagues in Saudi Arabia, for example, that I mentioned uh, that are generating these uh, uh, classifiers. And we think that uh, because we're documenting who makes the algorithm and there's description boxes of how they can say how, what cases were used, we think that, you know, the crowdsourcing solution is actually nice because it doesn't need to be one brain tumor classifier. There can be a brain tumor classifier from North America. There could be a brain tumor classifier using cases from uh, Africa. And so I think, and I, I think the crowdsourcing um, solution actually fits very nicely with that problem because it, it allows you to have an infinite amount of, of kind of uh, menu items that, that, that fit your population the best. Hello, uh, Dr. Diamandis, can you hear me? Yes. For your previous answer, we now have a question from the online Zoom chat from Jim Korkal. Uh, he asks, do patients know that their pathology slides are being uploaded to a public data set? And is it relevant? He's assuming it is completely anonymous. Yeah, so definitely everything, you know, all these studies, even though we're, um, um, all these studies, you know, have to pass REB approval. Uh, the nice thing about histology is that it's relatively anonymous. It's not like genetic information where you can trace it uh, and link it to other members of your family. Histology is, you know, felt to be a, a fairly anonymous um, uh, kind of uh, patient data. And we make sure that uh, whenever we scan slides, we, we strip any kind of identifiable information from those digital slides. Um, you know, the, the cases that I presented today, um, the, 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 our collaborators are, are using mostly at this period, they're using mostly uh, publicly available slides, um, uh, you know, as this proof of concept develops. But the, you know, I, I think as long as you follow your uh, kind of ethic board suggestions, um, uh, this, this is fairly non, a non-controversial, um, uh, you know, uh, tool. Answer? Answer. Answer. Thank you, Dr. Diamandis. I believe that's all the time we have for questions.